Well, welcome to Woodman. We are so glad that you are here with us as we gather together to celebrate our risen Lord. My name is Matt. I serve as the campus pastor here at Rock Rim. And and if this is your first time at Woodman, I want to say a very special welcome to you. We would love the opportunity to meet you in person, answer any questions that you may have, and get you connected to community here at Woodman after the service. Invite you to stop by Connect Central. It's right out these center doors. If you hang a left, you'll see See our team there. They would love to meet you. We just want you to know we are so glad that you are here with us today. Over the next hour or so, we will worship Christ. We'll worship through singing, through praying, through opening up God's word and studying that together. And at the end of our service, we will have the opportunity to worship through giving. As you leave, we'll have ushers at the exit doors. And every dollar that comes in this weekend, whether you give in person or online, will go outside of our walls as we partner with local partners here in our city that come alongside those who need real, practical, tangible help, perhaps getting food or struggling with homelessness. We believe that the gifts offered this weekend will offer hope to those in our community. You'll find a QR code at the back of your pew or via the Woodman app. You can open that and track along with the songs that we're singing, um, sermon notes from today, and other information about ways to get connected to a group, um, and would love for you to check that out. Well, if you would, stand with me. And whether you're coming in heavy-hearted or um, on the top of a mountain, let us proclaim together that Christ is risen, and that changes everything. So let's sing together. So let's proclaim that he is alive.
hallelujah. Welcome, happy Easter. So glad that you were with us this evening as we celebrate our resurrected King. And if you've been with us for the past few weeks, you've heard stories that, of pe that people have shared before the sermon of Jesus as friend, as our King, as our sacrificial lamb, and now we celebrate him as resurrected Lord. He is the cornerstone, the one we build our lives upon, our firm foundation. You may be in a, in a tough spot. I know Matt is so sensitive to that, Pastor Matt, this, uh, before the service began here. and Not everybody's coming in super joyous and joyful, even though we're celebrating something real and worth celebrating, I want to remind you that as we journey through the valleys and up to the mountaintops, that he is our firm foundation. We can build everything upon him. He is faithful, he is true, and he is our king. And we're going to continue to celebrate that now, so let's sing about our firm foundation. Christ is my firm foundation, the rock on which I stay when everything around me is shaken. I've never been more glad that I put my faith in Jesus, because he's never let me down. He's
was a moment when the lights went out when death had claimed its victory the king of love had given up his life the darkest day in history there on a cross they made for sin for every curse his blood atoned One final breath and it was finished But not the end we could have known For the earth began to shake And the veil was torn what sacrifice was made as the heavens
King Jesus, we praise you. For there is no other king that would lay his life down to save those who are lost. There is no other king that would show love full of mercy and grace and compassion to sinners. But you, but you, King Jesus, went to that cross for us. You died in our place. And then you rose from the grave and defeated the power of death. Hallelujah. We worship you. We praise you as Lord. And all God's people on this Easter weekend said, amen. You guys can take a seat. I think the most heartbreaking part of the Bible is, of course, Jesus being sacrificed and him being in the grave. But he doesn't stay in the grave because that would not be the story of our Lord Jesus at all. And I think it's really cool because when he comes out of the grave, you would expect him to be filled with like rage and anger and hatred towards these people who have crucified him. But that's not the story of Jesus either. He comes with this kindness and love that is just so beautiful and unexplainable. And it just makes me want to like take up my cross every day and fully surrender to him. To me, the most powerful event in all of human history was the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Because of that and his redemptive work on the cross, I have and we can now all have eternal life, eternal life and salvation through the good Lord Almighty. Jesus raising from the dead brings us hope because he said he will return one day and that really proves that he will return one day. Jesus died on this cross and rose again for me. Like nothing could compare to that. Nothing that I can do can compare to that. His death on the cross for our sins and then the resurrection just gave validity and truth to all of the works that he had done and that he was Lord and that he was over us and it just gives a lot of peace and joy in my life. When my world feels out of control, I know that he is in control, that there's nothing outside of his knowledge or his power um, that I can come confidently before the throne because he is Lord. Lord also means that I need to submit to him in obedience. And while that's my heart and desire, um, I'm a work in progress. In his death, and resurrection, he showed me that he is the King of kings and Lord of lords, and I can be happy. It blesses my soul to know that he gave his life for me, and he has risen. Knowing that it wasn't over, it wasn't just done with Jesus dying, it was still continued in him living, and it still continues in us today, and we can still trust that he's with us every day going through whatever we are. When I think of Jesus as Lord, I think of that song, Is He Worthy? And I think it because He is the only one who has conquered the grave. He is the only one without sin. And He is the only one who is worthy of all glory and blessing and honor. The Lamb of God died to save our sins, but it didn't end at death. It ended with Him rising from the dead, overcoming the world, and being Lord over all creation. Jesus is my Lord. 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 Well, he is risen. Yeah. Amen. Yes, he is. Hello, and thank you for being with us. My name is Josh. If you are a visitor, I'm one of the pastors here, and we are excited to celebrate our risen Lord together. You know, you don't have to be very old before you realize that life can bring joy and sorrow. Now, hopefully at the front end of life, it's the presence or absence of fishy crackers, but as you get older, that joy and that sorrow can, well, grow much deeper. And it often comes sort of unexpectedly so. I recently officiated the wedding of a couple who had bumped into each other. They first met in a line in their freshman year of college, then went their separate ways, never knowing that at that moment they were standing before who would be their future spouse. And now, husband and wife. On the flip side, 
recently received news from an old friend. His wife, mother to three of his kids, just told that her body was riddled with cancer. Both these unforeseen, unexpected moments in time that changed everything. Now, for the first followers of Jesus, they experienced what would be their worst day ever and the best thing that they could never have imagined compressed into three days. They believed that Jesus was their coming Messiah, but they had their hopes dashed when he was crucified on a Friday and placed dead in a tomb. On that Friday night, no one among them anticipated the news that they would receive Sunday morning that Jesus Christ had risen from the grave. And that, that changed everything. The Gospel of Luke is, is the third account of the earthly life of Jesus recorded in the New Testament. And, and Luke wrote it with some very clear objectives in mind, which he states right up front. In Luke chapter 1, verse 1, it says, Inasmuch as many have undertaken to compile a narrative of the things that have been accomplished among us, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word have delivered them to us, it seemed good to me also, having followed all things closely for some time past, to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, that you may have certainty concerning the things that you have been taught. Luke wrote to a man named Theophilus so that he, and by extension we, could have certainty. Certainty that Christianity is based on historical fact. It's, it's, it's comprised of events that have happened. And those events have been verified by witnesses who observe them. And you could be here, one of these rooms, and very well disagree with much of what the Bible teaches. But if Jesus rose from the grave, I would think, well, that changes everything. And I would imagine you'd want to give that some thought. I will admit, it does all sound rather incredulous but I don't want you to take my word for it. We're going to look at those who witnessed it first and, and see what they said. And though unexpected, maybe today changes everything for you. So if you would, allow me to pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you now with, with hearts that are full as we celebrate our risen Lord. God, I say that recognizing that not everybody listening to me might hold to that same joy or that same belief. And so as crazy as it might be for them to hear, I pray that you would do a work, that you would open their hearts to see what it is that we do. I certainly pray I don't get in the way of it. Pray I don't make any mistakes and be glorified in our midst, we ask. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, if you want to follow along, we're going to be in Luke chapter 24, beginning at verse 36. And the thing to know is nobody saw this coming. I mean, nobody saw this coming. It says this in verse 36. As they were talking about these things, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, peace to you. But they were startled and frightened and thought that they saw a spirit. Now, that first Easter Sunday was quite a day. Women had gone to the tomb to anoint the body of Jesus only to find it empty then Jesus appears to this man named Peter, and then Jesus appears to these two guys on, on a little road trip to Emmaus, and, and then they drop their plans and they hustle back to Jerusalem to tell the disciples what it is they've seen. When it says, as they were talking about these things, 
That, that is what was being discussed. Uh, they were talking about these, these appearances, having seen the resurrected Lord, a handful of people telling them it's true, and the rest of them thinking they're crazy town. That just doesn't, well, it just doesn't happen. When suddenly, Luke says, Jesus himself stood among them. Now, it is possible that Jesus did so, you know, like ninja-like and just kind of slipped in, but, but the text in Greek sort of just really gives the impression that he just appeared. Just in their midst, Jesus pops into the scene and says to them, peace to you, which would have been somewhat expected and shocking at the same time. Because peace to you was, was a common greeting back then. You bump into a friend on the street, peace to you. That's just what you said. Now that being said, <laughs> this room is filled with people who had abandoned Jesus at his hour of need. If I'm Jesus, I'm leading off with something a little stronger. <laughs> but he does the essential, hey, Hey guys, peace to you. Now regardless of what Jesus started with, I'm not sure at the time they gave it much thought at all because it says they were terrified. They thought, they thought they were seeing a ghost. None of them expected Jesus to rise from the dead. They are freaked out. Which is a curious response to record if they made the whole thing up. See, one of the angles skeptics like to take is that the resurrection of Jesus was actually just like the greatest cover-up ever devised that the disciples had, in reality, stolen the body and, and then just kept telling people that he had risen from the dead. Which, if true, just makes them bad storytellers because every time they record anybody seeing the resurrected Lord, nobody believes it at first. Even those who encounter him don't believe it. In each and every case recorded in the New Testament, the authors preserve the doubt the first witness has had. But none of those first witnesses ever change their statement. They all went to their death, saying it happened. It's true they didn't see it coming, but they went to their death saying it had. And if it did, wouldn't you like to know? I'm telling you, Jesus rose from the grave. Verse 38 says, and he said to them, why are you troubled? And, and why do doubts arise in your heart? See, see my hands and my feet, that it's I myself. Touch me and see, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. It actually is a little bit of a sassy thing to say, right? Because <laughs> everybody thought that he was dead. And the second thing out of Jesus' mouth is essentially, what's the problem, boys? You look like you've seen a ghost. Now, to be fair to Jesus, the situation did warrant a measure of sass because Jesus actually had told them several times that he was going to rise from the grave. It's just that they never believed him when he said it. But to be fair to the disciples... He was dead and now is alive, and so this is rather shocking. Now, if Jesus were more like me, 
This, this would have been an epic time for the ultimate I told you so, <laughs> right? Like just recount, we were there, you were eating a taco, I told you, you didn't believe me, boom. But, but that's not how Jesus responds to them. Jesus doesn't chastise them at all for their lack of faith. But, but instead, he invites them to investigate. Jesus realized that what is happening is, is really a lot to take in. So Jesus takes it slow. He starts walking around to him, and he's like, look at my hand, look, look at the nail, that's, that's me. Pete, my foot, God, flesh, bone. It's, it's me. It's not a ghost. It is I myself. That, the, the Greek there is the strongest possible affirmation. He's like, it's me. And the next bit is downright comical. Verse 41 says, and while they were still disbelieved for joy and were marveling, he said to them, have you anything to eat? And they gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate it before them. Now, typically, I I think, safe to say, we we don't typically, you know, associate joy as a reason for not believing something. Uh, we, we, We don't often cite joy as our reason for disbelief. Though we do sometimes say something's too good to be true, right? Scripture says they disbelieved for joy and were marveling. So jaws dropped in the room, and Jesus, is there anything to eat around here? What is consistent throughout the New Testament? In each and every resurrection appearance, is that even though Jesus is standing in their midst, the common denominator in each and every case was this surreal cocktail of of astonishment and disbelief, of, of joy and doubt. They were disbelieving for joy. And Jesus' deep theological response is, do you have anything to eat? You can half picture that disciple whose jaw is dropped. He's kind of reaching for the fish and and half expecting it to fall through Jesus' ghost hand. You know what I mean? But Jesus grabs it. Malt vinegar, we don't do that anymore. He, He just starts to have a snack. Now, I mean, it had been three days, so he's probably hungry somewhat, right? But he he just dials down the temperature. It's I myself, guys. I'm right here. Now, you may understandably question the veracity of their claim. But in each and every resurrection appearance, Jesus, who had been dead, is presented as a real, living man in the flesh. Very much alive. And given the alternative that we all face, is there not some appeal to hearing about this? I once met with a guy who I think is representative of of a lot. We were having a good conversation, not argumentative in the least, going back and forth. And I I just casually, I was just like, so what do you think happens? What do you think happens when we die? And he said, rather plainly and to the point, it's over. We just cease to exist. That's what I think. Which, if true does make everything I'm saying pointless and makes the career I've chosen somewhat of a waste of time. (laughs) But,
it's really not all that problematic. And by that, I mean if at the end of our lives we truly do just get snuffed out and cease to exist, that at the end of our lives, you or I won't know that I once was standing up here saying, I think there's something more. Should be no harm, no foul. But if I will exist beyond the grave, if, if I will have a physical body similar, hopefully a little taller, more muscular, but similar <laughs> to the one that I have now, if, if I'm going to be recognizable as that former pastor named Josh who once told you he foolishly thinks he's going to exist beyond the grave, then that will be very problematic for you. should you choose to ignore it. This, this is the story of the Bible. Verse 44 says, then he said to them, these are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. And this is not in any sort of I told you so sort of way. But Jesus gently, he begins to recall to their minds all that he had told them before. And when he references the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms, he's referring to what we in the church today call the Old Testament, the, the first bit. He, he, he is saying that all, all of it, all of it was pointing to him. Jesus is like, remember what I taught you. It was all about me. And then in verse 45, we read, then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures and said to them, thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead and that repentance for the forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations beginning from Jerusalem. See, the crucifixion of Jesus is not something that just happened to him. It's something that he pursued. From the very get-go of the book, the plan always was for the Son of God to give up his life and rise on the third day. Jesus came to the earth to conquer death. It's what we refer to as the gospel. And, and, and that translated is, it, it's what we refer to as the good news. In our sin, we separated ourselves from the God who made us. We put a division between us. And, and you may be unfamiliar with the term sin or not a big fan of it. Okay, but you're very familiar with its effects. Sin brought death. God did not create us to die. God created us to live. And when we turned from him and went after our own thing, thinking that we had found it, what we found was death. This entire book is, is the story of God's radical pursuit of those who abandoned him and of his love so great that he would ask his son to die for the ones who left him. And on the third day, rise. The bottom line of the book is that each and every one of us must repent. And, and the word there is, is simply to turn. It, it's to recognize that the sin, you don't like the, the naughty things, the stuff that our hearts pursue and like, that we say no longer and we turn and go the other way asking him to forgive us for having ever left 
confessing him as Lord, believing that God raised him from the dead, and in doing so, having a confidence that we one day will rise as well. And here's the thing which will sound jiggy, but I actually really believe it. You don't need to take my word for it. You, you could ask him yourself. Verse 45 said, then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. Then Jesus opened their minds, which is a profound thing to say because it points to like a twofold dynamic that is present in the Easter story. Even with Jesus in the flesh, standing in the room, even with Jesus eating fish and chips in the room, that was not in and of itself enough for them to believe. They still were disbelieving for joy. They had, they had to have him open their minds to his word. And only then did they connect all the dots and believe. I, I will go out on a limb and say, strong chance you have never seen the resurrected Lord in the flesh. But even if you had, that does not mean you would necessarily believe. You need him to open your minds to his reason to his purpose, and if you were to earnestly ask Jesus to do that, I really believe you will see him quite clearly. And it is, it is a choice that we each have. Verse 48 says, Jesus, Jesus concludes, this is, this is his conclusion. Jesus concludes his time with them that night by saying, you are witnesses of these things. And behold, I am sending the promise of my father upon you, but stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. Those in the room that night were witnesses to two things. The resurrected Christ and his reason for coming. He didn't simply just rise from the grave. He came to conquer death itself. And Jesus told them on that night to take that message to the world, but not before they received his spirit, not before they received that power from on high that would give them life. And it would change everything. The remainder of this book is the story of the emanating, moving forward spread of the gospel as more and more men and women, young and old, agreed with them and said, it is true. He is risen indeed. And what we have to just acknowledge is the people in the room that night <clears throat> They were not the power brokers. They were not the insta-famous. They were not the influencers. They were not in political authority. They were the ones who had failed him. Jesus did not go to those who crucified him. Jesus did not appear to Pilate. I mean, you'd think it would have been a lot easier if you had. No, Jesus wanted to appear to those who had failed him so they would know what it means to experience grace. That he 
forgave them. And still today, Jesus most readily and suddenly appears to those who recognize, my thing isn't working. I, I am the one who has failed. I wonder, I wonder if he'll appear to you today. See, peace to you, right? Peace to you was the common greeting. And it was a good greeting, better than how are you, because peace to you actually embodied all that we are actually looking for. And it referred not simply to the absence of war, but but the absence of of the internal dissonance that plagues us. The peace of which it speaks is the absence of the thought that this life we live is futile and without point. The peace speaks, it it looks beyond platitudes and and success and and the accumulation of what the world holds dear. It it, it takes away that seemingly never-ending pursuit of satisfaction. It refers to a physical and spiritual wholeness that allows one to sleep well at night, regardless of what that day brought. What they did not recognize initially that first Easter was that this peace that they had wished upon people countless times before was actually not a wish at all, but a person that they could introduce them to, introduce people to. I personally and so many at Woodman, we'll tell you we've met him. And we would love to introduce you to him. We are his witnesses. We are not perfect. We encounter the joys and sorrows of this life just like you. But we do so with a hope that looks beyond the grave. And I'm telling you, that changes everything. You have a choice. What will you choose? Allow me to pray. Our Heavenly Father, I thank you for the glorious hope we have in Jesus Christ our Lord, the first to go from death to life. God, I pray that as we sing your praises, as we lift high your name, as we exalt the name of Christ, would you make yourself known? Would you open people's hearts? Would they see what it is we've seen and know this one, our risen Lord, of whom we speak. In his name, amen. If when you are up for it, why don't you stand with us as we sing. darkness we were waiting without hope without love till from heaven you came running there was mercy in your eyes to fulfill the law and prophets to a virgin came the word 
From a throne of endless glory to a cradle in the dirt. Praise the Father, praise the Son, praise the Spirit, three in a word.
A glorious truth that we remind ourselves and remind each other that hope, that peace is here and has come in the person and the work of Jesus Christ. And that is the truth that then changes us and then ultimately, ultimately grounds us as an anchor for our soul. And when the storms come, when circumstances are tough, we are safe, we are secure in his hands, and that is indeed glorious. If you have questions, if you want to get an introduction to that man, Jesus, if perhaps the circumstances of life are hard, are difficult, and you need to be reminded of that truth, Come talk to us. We would love to pray with you. We would love to chat, you, chat with you. We'll be up front. We would love to see you back next weekend as we start a new series looking at uh, some various psalms. Saturday at 6, Sunday at 9 and 11. We would love to see you. And as a reminder, if you so choose to give on the way out, you can do so with the ushers at the door. Know that we love you. Our Father in heaven sees you and he loves you, but go with these words. And now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy. To the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. Amen. Go in his grace and go in his peace.